have an unidentified flying object. Researcher on a mission with Dr. J. Andy Elias. Rome Radio, as I said, uh, we have, an, as usual, an incredible show for you today, but today is extra special because not only do we have two guests for you, they're two of the nicest, coolest people I know who are also filmmakers, which give them that extra notch and are doing great things. These two gentlemen are responsible for the Citizen Hearing documentary. They co-own CHDH, CHD2 Productions or CHD Squared Productions, better to say, who essentially are producing the Citizen Hearing dis- uh, documentary. And without further ado, let me bring them on. Here's Jeremy Kenyon, Lockyer Corbell, and Ruben Langdon. Mr. Corbell, Mr. Langdon, welcome to the show. How's it going, John? Oh, it's, I'm doing excellent. How are you, Jeremy? Very good. Thanks for having us on. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And as we were saying off air, I didn't get a chance for my co-host to say hi to you, uh, except for off air. Johnny and Laura, welcome uh, on and, and to our guests as well. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Look, hi guys. I I figured a best way to start this off, since we've been keeping with the citizen hearing tradition, essentially since it happened last April as, or early May, uh, April 29th to May 4th, or April, the last day of April, essentially to the fir- the first week of May, is what it was. Five days, over 40 right. witnesses top witnesses ranging from seven countries. Uh, You had colonels in there. You had general, a general from Iran. You had a general from Peru. You had the former defense minister of Canada, Paul Hellyer, who's joined us right here on these very same airwaves, who's also be joining us next week, testified in front of five retired members of Congress, as well as one retired senator. Over those five days, I was watching the citizen hearings from beginning to end, every single bit of testimony. The part that intrigued me the most, both of you, I'm going to say this to both of you, was watching the transformation. I remember each day you guys were both filming the entire hearings and, of course, the follow-up interviews of each of the committee members. And at the end of the first day, I remember Mike Gravel's uh, just put the Senator Mike Gravel's Uh, comparing day one to day five, his post day interview, he went from being open minded saying, I'm coming into this open minded. I've heard some testimony today that I am willing to uh, keep an open mind, but I'm not fully convinced to five days later saying unequivocally, we are being engaged by one or more races not originating here on earth. And the government has been covering it up since 1947, if not earlier. Those two statements are some of the most profound statements coming from a former United States senator, which makes him officially the highest ranking United States politician to ever to speak on this public to- openly in such a fashion. And you guys producing something so important is, is why I brought you on to the show to talk about that. And I wanted to ask you, why now? Why, why didn't we do this a few months ago or three months later or last year? Why does – we both know the answer to this, all, three, all five of us. But I want the <laughs> listeners to know that the answer to this. Um, I'll give it to – let's start with Jeremy and then we'll go to Ruben. Yeah, well, you know, thanks for asking the question. I, I think your question is, you know, why are we talking about this now? How did we get to this point? Um, I, I think it's, first of all, very important just to recognize that uh, my partner, Ruben Langdon, none of this would have happened without him. None of this. I mean, he was really the, the, the engine behind this. Um, Ruben had the ability to bring this onto a main stage and to set up the documentation um, of this event, which is more important than the event itself, is the documentation of it. And so that's why I'm really grateful to be involved, because um, exactly what you've said, uh, once you hear the testimony, once you spend the time educating yourself and becoming educated by these individuals and these officials who did testify under oath, um, the, the evidence is very compelling. It's weighty. You walk away with a deeper respect and understanding for those people that have put it on the line in order to tell the truth from their perspective about this subject, despite ridicule, 
despite blowback they might get. And uh, that's what occurred. That is really, these are the heroes of, uh, you know, the, the people of the citizen hearing, the people that testified. And there's a lot of unsung heroes, such as uh, Ruben Langdon, in my opinion, who really, you know, put all, <laughs> everything he had on the line to get this done. But essentially, um, you know, now that we're, you know, deeply in this and working together in tandem so well, I think that Ruben and I can both testify. We found that the process has been moving really well and that, that we have created uh, a, a level of, um, I guess, aesthetic beauty to the filming of the citizen hearing uh, that is unparalleled. So the actual footage itself, the actual testimony itself, uh, Ruben has really been responsible for the editing here and making it just flawless. It's all available now for the public to view and engage. Go to citizenhearing.org and you'll be able to literally, uh, on video on demand, watch it for yourself and become informed like Senator Gravel and become informed like a number of other individuals who listened to the testimony that week. Let me throw in one thing before I go to you, Ruben. And let me say, I commend Jeremy for you, Jeremy, for saying what you said about Ruben because I remember when I met both of you at. Your studio, Ruben, leading up to the several months, you guys were deep hard into this. And I remember, Ruben, you did so much above and beyond in, in leading up to this. And it wasn't until it actually happened that I realized what is such a massive production. Now, let me go on the comment real quick of what I meant to say, what I didn't want to interrupt when you were speaking, Jeremy, of why the documentation is so important. Not just so the whole world can wake up, but for other politicians. And let me tell you who in particular that I basically cold called and put him on and backed him into a corner to kind of get him a, a statement out of him. He didn't, he ended up getting out of that corner, but uh, he's still in email contact, which thank God. I cold called Governor Dukakis, Michael Dukakis. I, he oh. goes to the same Greek church as I do. I hadn't seen him there in over a decade. And I just knew that he teaches at UCLA every year at a certain time. So what I did was, is the day that I had Senator Gravel right here this past February, I had called Senator Gravel and said, hey, we're going to go on in five minutes, but hey, do you mind if I call Dukakis right now and, ha and be able to link you two together so you can basically help me get him on board to pay attention to this? So when I called Dukakis, he told me with Senator Gravel on the other line, because he didn't want to be connected. He goes, no, I'm in the middle of something, but tell him I said, hi, tell a fellow Bostonian I said, hi. I said, well, he really needs to speak to you because he was a part of the citizen hearing. Do you know anything about that? And that's when he wanted to take it to emailing. That's where he got himself out of the corner. But I just want to give everybody an update that he is currently, has been watching these citizen hearings and he made a comment essentially about the, the nuclear portion is what was interesting, but he never got further than that. But the point, the reason I'm saying the documentation is so important is if it wasn't for this documentation, people down the line can just say, oh, those hearings, I remember hearing about them on TV. But it's one thing to hear about them, and it's another thing to see them. That's what's going to change the world. I, I yeah, agree that's, that's that the document... We... Go ahead. Oh, no, yeah, no, I I, I agree. Yes, I was going to say, yeah, that, that's kind of, that was the initial goal of the hearings is to, to have a, a documented event uh, and also to have important people, the Congress members, there to kind of ask the right questions and present it in a in a uh, palatable um, presenting. Because up up until now, uh, most of the information we've gotten is just from the whistleblowers personally putting their putting out books, putting out you know History Channel doing their documentaries or doing a number of different documentaries that touch on each individual uh, events, but and going and some of them actually go into quite some detail, but to have the perspective and ask the questions that the general public uh, wants to ask, and that's hopefully you know we, the uh, Congress members were were there to ask those questions that the newbie, so to say, would would ask, and coming at this from you know uh, sort of a skeptical. Uh, position and ask the right questions and and that we believe that's what happened you know it was it, it it's quite amazing how smooth it went considering <laughs> everything that was going on behind the scenes yeah, that's true but it, it did go you, i'm glad you you yeah. mentioned that cuz it, it did go perfectly in the sense of what they asked yeah. they asked questions exactly. exactly as they would in a real congressional hearing they came in as 
skeptics, and they started as such. They were basically trying to poke holes in the stories. They were trying to essentially impeach the people by being politely, but still trying to take down their credibility. But once they, one thing I got both Congressman Merrill Cook and Senator Gravel again on these airwaves, and Congressman Cook will be joining us again in January here on Revolution Radio to speak about this, is both of them, the first thing out of their mouth, what convinced them was the credibility of the witnesses. They said never in a million years would they have thought that these, this quality amount of people, such as Paul Hellyer, former defense minister of Canada, still to date the highest ranking member of the G8 countries, who, like I said before, Senator Gravel is the highest ranking American politician, but this is one step right. further. This is essentially what equivalent was Donald Rumsfeld during the 9-11 era. That's what Paul Hellyer is. So by him testifying on one side of the table to his because he was a member of parliament prior to becoming defense minister. And so uh, aside from him, we had Colonel Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr. And as I said, we had the uh, general I don't remember his last name, but from Iran and all the way from Colonel French. And then, of course, a handful of researchers, Stanton Friedman, our good friend, departed friend, Roger Lear, Dr. Roger Lear. Yeah. And, and they both said it was the credibility. And then the secondary then was they got into some incidents. And, of course, the nuclear incidents and Rendlesham stuck out in their head more than anything because there was a lot of testimony. But, again, this goes back to how important the questions were coming from them. And so I got to commend you guys for being a part of something. But now this happened, and we got to look to the future of educating the rest of the world. And you guys have finally put this up on the web for everybody to see and at a reasonable cost. What is the cost to rent it for all five days? Yeah, so um, I have to actually look up my our own website. Um, so I'll look up right we're, now. We're doing <laughs> download. I think we can, you can download them all for $99 mm-hmm. or you can rent them. Um, what's the rent price? For Jeremy, 49 yeah, forty nine. So yeah, you're right. So you can yeah, you download all HD for ninety nine dollars, and then you own them as well. That, and yeah, and that's 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 over thirty hours of footage. one. Yeah, that's one day and seven hours of straight streaming footage. I mean, well, yeah, yeah exactly. 30, These were full congressional hearings, and if I'm not mistaken, yeah. you already also have the nightly lectures included as well, right? That that's an additional that's a completely additional uh, you know, video on demand and there we have ten different lectures from some of the top researchers uh, within the, the the field of ufology and um, these you can rent all of them for, for you know under fifteen bucks fourteen ninety five and then you can buy them all for under forty bucks uh, thirty nine ninety five so you know all of this material and, and by the way that's ten hours and thirty minutes so. Um, what you're getting as far as the historical testimony, as far as these evening lectures, is unparalleled. It's absolutely unparalleled. I'm going to ask you both a question that what we didn't see who observed it, and since I wasn't in Washington, I watched everything here from California remotely through the live, uh, essentially broadcast, uh, it's almost in this essence what you were doing from, if I'm not mistaken, the same website. What biggest fiascos in a good way, fuss-wise, maybe from the outside media, uh, or what problems, I don't want to say problems, that's the wrong word I'm looking for, but (laughs) what caught you guys most off guard as far as production-wise, and then more importantly, testimony-wise, and even Congress and and Senator reaction-wise? What was it that stu- stuck out to both of you in both the positive and the negative light? Although I've, all of it's a positive experience, as you mentioned, of course, there were some hurdles to overcome. But I wanted to ask you both, what is it, pressure that you left from there? Because of, you took a lot in, right. a lot more than we did. We are watching it remotely. Uh, you want me to jump on this one first, Jeremy? Yeah, please, please Ruben. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say the biggest uh, noticeable... Um, Aggravating, but yet also, um, I guess, uh, overcoming odds that we had was the media. So the general media that was coming in on Monday, 
uh, and by Monday night, we were already getting a lot of media attention. So like the Washington Post and a lot of other media was really discrediting the whole thing. Uh, and there's a couple of people, you know, you know, with any type of UFO sort of event, um, you get all sorts of people from all walks of life. And uh, there was a couple, actually, that had these uh, headbands on with, I guess, crystals on them or something. And the media was immediately, so there was, you know, we, we opened it to the public for anyone to come in and watch as long as there was enough seats. And um, they were the only two out of, you know, maybe 100 plus, 200 people that were coming through the event for the week. But these only, only the two people, with they had these little crystals on their head. Uh, immediately the media focuses on them, puts them on the front page and says, you know, UFO event in Washington, D.C. and kind of makes fun of the whole thing. And, uh, you know, and then makes the focus on these two individuals with crystals on their head. Uh, and then they go into all this uh, stuff about, you know, they literally interviewed them about the event instead of interviewing the, the, the proper people who are putting on the event or any of the witnesses that are actually part of the event. So that was kind of disheartening at first in seeing the the media go in that direction. However, um, by day three, day four, the positive media side started coming out. Uh, Al Jazeera uh, and the the other um, Senator Gravel and other Congress members were starting to speak to the media. They were holding off on a lot of their media engagements until later until they had digested more of it so they could talk about it. So I guess their interviews were more in depth and they were talking about the seriousness of the issue. And the, I guess the, the good point that came out is, and the, and I remember the energy was so high uh, on Friday night when the uh, New York times actually released a, the first article in the history of New York times to actually give a, uh, a legit article on the subject without poking fun on it. You know, uh, that, that, I'm glad and, you mentioned the, the New York Times. Because yeah. One thing that bothered me first was on day one, I didn't see them there. Mm -hmm. I, at least I didn't hear from them. It wasn't no, day five, right? No, we, we, we got them. We had a contact. Uh, luckily, um, uh, we had a reporter. I guess he was a, more of a photographer. And he had gotten in touch with somebody from them. And they weren't even going to cover the event. And he he said, "Look, you got to you guys got to get down here. This is serious stuff." Finally, somebody came. I think Wednesday or Thursday, and then they started interviewing a bunch of other people not involved with the thing. Like they, I think they actually interviewed Leslie Payne and um, and some others <laughs> who weren't even involved in the in the hearings. Uh, I guess they're trying to get cover all scopes. But uh, you know, to to our surprise, um, or not so much to our surprise because we knew the, the, the event was legit. But I guess to um, people who've been in this a lot longer than I have, um, I know I remember some of the other witnesses had been really following uh, the the history of the New York Times and the reportings on UFO in, in, incidents. And this was, to their words, the first time in history that the New York Times actually gave a positive, uh, and when I say positive, they were basically not making fun of the issue and they were taking it for what it is and saying, look, we need to do more investigation into this matter. And this is, this is something serious. It was, yeah, I mean, that's, the, that's, that's, you know, the back page or whatever it was, it wasn't on the front page. Well, no, but, I mean, you know. yeah, Ruben, this, this is really monumental. And I think we should nail this home a little bit. And what you're on May 3rd, 2013, the New York times did a full page article you know, about the right. citizen hearing and about this topic, you know, this topic deserves scrutiny. It yes. deserves a fair shake. And by, by having all these people collected and by, by bringing all these people together under this setting at the National Press Club, it merited this type of attention. And you know what? The, the, the news should reflect the interest of the public. That's kind of the, the point here. The news is, you know, giving us information, we hope, that we want to know. And there are so many people interested in this because it is a real uh, experience people have been and are having. So I think it's only fair that the, the New York Times actually finally did an article on May 3rd, 2013 that, you know, looked at the subject. And again, it was a cursory look. It was a one-page article. We can do better, guys. But exactly. it was great that it, 
it's, but it was great that it came out. So, Ruben, I, you know, I think what you're driving at here is that this was actually a historic moment, and it was powerful. Right, right. But it's just, it's just the beginning. Yes, and yeah. I'm glad you both said this. Uh, that fact that a it needs the scrutiny because if you don't have it, if you don't let people try to poke holes in it, so it can strengthen the cases, then of course it's just going to fall back into the ridicule map. So by opening it up to that scrutiny by the public and by the journalists, then of course it'll be better for us all. The problem I still fear is that no matter if you go to the liberal media or the conservative media, you're still in that small frame where they don't let you out of that uh, corporate lock. Because if it's not in their interest, which of course you could see CIA documents going back to, for instance, Roswell. Uh, in 1947, after the crash, one of the ladies in, I think, in the newspaper was writing over the wire uh, about what happened. And essentially, she got a, a message from the FBI that says, do not continue the transmission of this teletype. And then flash forward later, I'm sure you know this, Terry Hansen actually uncovered the paper trail of the wor Weekly World News. If you remember, that was the most outlandish tabloid, and they always had Bat Boy on the front, Hil Hillary Clinton pregnant with alien baby, all that stuff. But in there, though, sadly, in there was actual real cases. And, and what they were trying to do was belittle the little cases. But if you look at the, the following all this, this actually was funded by the CIA. I, I think it, they started with a $75,000 stipend or grant to get this going. It was in the private hands, but the links go back of, of forming a, a super ultra tabloid to do this. But what I'm grateful for is the citizen hearing did not appear in something like that. And yes, it, right. it did take five days for the New York Times to get there. I was upset each day that I was tuning into CNN at the end of the day or Fox News, any of them, hoping to get a glimpse of them. But we didn't. But thank God we made the New York Times. Yeah. Well, yeah, New York and, Times and was a big one. Yes. Yeah, and it, look, it's, it's important to, to notice here that you know the media is not the enemy. The media is not even the problem, no matter how much we can you know, kind of hope or, you know, that we get attention to this or for that to raise this issue or that issue. The, the reality is in the world today, you know, our attention, it's, it's a democracy now. You know, if you have something that's valuable enough, then we do have the power to propagate with or without major magazines what is truly going on. So the power is now in our hands. And, and it's nice when, you know, mainstream media, you know, attempts to engage topics that are as important as this topic, but we need to feel more empowered about it. We have the ability now to put anything out instantaneously. Uh, we, we have the ability to put it out in text, in film, in audio, and it's really up to us to engage that and to take responsibility for that. So again, really nice. LA Times decided to talk about what millions of Americans and people across the world want to hear about. Good for them. But I think that they're going to have to follow in suit as more and more people are interested and in becoming educated on this topic. Yes, and exactly. And that's why I'm glad that we, you came on now to announce that the citizen hearing lectures, the entire testimony, all 40 plus hours of all five days is finally available for the world to see. And this comes at a very crucial time. Why? Because we're leading into the next presidential campaign. Yes, it's about two years away. But as you know, we're going to start being slammed with television ads for the primaries. And then, of course, once they narrow down their party opponents, then, of course, we're going to be slammed with a full year of that. But along with those elections comes everything else in the mix that has to do with them. And if you remember last time, Dennis Kucinich was and basically lost his bid for presidency because he mentioned the UFO topic. So I'm hoping that there's people more informed now. Now, I'm sure we're going to end up in break before either of you can even have a chance to answer the next question. And of course, later we'll get to other people. I mean, I, I'm going to mention to everybody, because maybe this might kill the time for the break, that these two filmmakers, this is not their only project. And they have been astounding filmmakers for quite some time. There's a, quite a few things that you, uh, everybody out there is going to be able to get a chance to see. Uh, if you all remember when John Lear was on with Jeremy Corbell, we were talking about the movie Immaculate Deception. That's going to be due out. It's coming. Yeah. 
next year. And with that being said, everybody, hang tight. We're going to be speaking more to Ruben Langdon and Jeremy Corbell on Citizen Hearing, other projects, John Lear, UFO Congress, and so much more. They don't dismiss it. If they see a ghostly apparition, the whole village or city accepts it. And that's what's great about it. So uh, what's happening in our borders doesn't necessarily reflect the rest of the world sees it. And I'm glad you brought up Brazil, uh, although I mentioned it as one of the countries, but you specifically that they're not relying on oil because guess what? They don't have to answer to us who could keep them in a chokehold, essentially saying, well, we'll not get, make sure oil doesn't get to you or uh, essentially right. controlling the, the, the prices. Speaking of prices, or, billionaires, as you mentioned real quick, uh, I know I said Paul Hellyer is coming on next month, but actually Johnny and I got a chance to speak to him yesterday as we pre-recorded him for another show. And we were speaking about the 600 top billionaires on this earth. Did you know that in 2013 they raised their net worth by an extra, an extra half a trillion dollars an extra 500 billion dollars was gained by approximately 620 billionaires that's almost 1 billion dollars extra each now when you have that kind of money you can control things and i would not be surprised if these are the people that are involved in the shadow government that's been keeping us the secret from us and this actually may be a good segue uh, to the Immaculate Deception and other stuff because, of course, John Lear, when, we were, when he was on here, the courtesy of you, Jeremy, thank you for, for bringing him on with, with you, of course. That was a phenomenal show both times we've spoken to both of you. Uh, he's, he's, like you mentioned, he's the godfather of conspiracy, and I know he would feel the same way of uh, these, the Bilderbergers, or as, as Paul Hellier calls them, the cabal. Same thing as Edgar Mitchell calls them, the cabal. Uh, isn't that a sad thing that that kind of money can buy the silence and essentially control policy for other countries? Uh, gl- geopolitical policies can be made just by money. The golden rule is no longer do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's basically that those who have the most gold make the rules. And uh, it's a sad world that we live in, but I'm hoping that we can change that because with these alien artifacts that a lot of these witnesses testify to, such as the late Colonel Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr., who actually held some Roswell wreckage in his hand in the late wee morning hours July 8th, 1947. It was the 8th because it was the 7th that his father found him. But point being is this comes all back to the cabal hiding it, the billionaires running essentially the world because of their great influence, and us being blocked from the truth. Who gave them the authority to tell them what's good for us to know and what not? Who gave them the authority to prevent us from using... uh, free energy, in essence, or any of these tools. Paul Hellyer is convinced uh, through his sources he didn't want to say who. And that's one great thing about knowing a politician who knows other politicians and other high-ranking military members. He is absolutely 110% convinced that these oil cartels have been in possession of free energy uh, devices from crashed and retrieved disks from reverse engineering over the course of uh, 70 years at least. Uh, Knight Roswell was not the first. Cape Girardeau incident in Missouri 1941 probably wasn't even the first. You could even go back to Aurora 1896 or China. Supposedly a disk crashed there about 10,000 B.C. or maybe 10,000 years ago, 5,000 B.C. or 8,000. point I'm trying to get at, though, is that there's so much more to this story, and there's, we were only able to get to the tip of the iceberg, and the tip of the iceberg was enough to blow open this, the eyes and the, the minds, more importantly, to blow the minds of the committee members and blow me away, who is already, I don't want to say uh, I'm not so shocked anymore when I hear news, but I was shocked to see such a transformation. And now, how can we implement this transformation from around the world aside from pounding them with continuing testimony from bringing live witnesses on these radio shows and then directing the people to the Citizen Hearing website? Yeah, uh, 
Yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. Oh, no, so I just, yeah, a, a lot of what, you know, you guys are, are talking about is, you know, quite frankly, outside of my scope, I, I don't have, um, you know, direct knowledge of uh, how secrets are kept, let's say, or who they're kept by, or what the agendas are. I mean, I've always kind of maintained the philosophy that the true architects of the secrecy are the visitors themselves. I mean, you know, if they want it to be revealed, they would reveal themselves. And so, um I, I don't know. It is beyond my scope to even begin to think how this information is being suppressed or by whom it is being suppressed. But essentially, none of that matters. What, what, what matters is what we can do. And I feel that what we can do is step by step begin to educate the public that there is a conversation going on. And that it is under great hardship sometimes that people have to hold secrets because they're under oath to the U.S. military or militaries of the world. And it, it's courageous to come forward and talk about these things. I, I have to reflect upon a story that I know very well, which is the Bob Lazar story. Yes. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. Very, very good yeah. segue. Keep going. Well, it's just, you know, he is the, he doesn't like to be called this, but he is the Snowden of ufology. I mean, in my opinion, Here's a guy, you know, 29 years old that you know, came out in 1989 and said, I've worked deep within the most secret projects within the United States government, and this is what I've seen. And you may not fully comprehend it or even be able to receive the information I'm telling you, but we are back engineering craft that were made not here on Earth. And he just straight said that. And then for years, people have been debating and arguing and fighting amongst themselves about what he said, and if it's true, and if he went to school here, or if he went to school there, or if you can verify X, Y, or Z. But bottom line is, and, and this is, you know, George Knapp will say this often, bottom line is that he knew exactly when these test flights of these flying discs were going to occur over Papoose Lake, and he took people out there to see them. Uh, you know, at George Knapp, as an investigator, has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt a number of things about Bob Lazar. It all lead towards a very simple fact. Bob Lazar was out there. He did work within the deepest realms of secret projects within the United States military. And uh, he told us what he saw. And his story remains the same. It has not changed, has not altered. And that's why I'm so excited um, that Bob has begrudgingly decided, because of George's uh, arm twisting, right, to come back out again. And he will be speaking uh, at the at the conference we talked about in February at the 2015 UFO uh, International UFO Congress, as will and um, as will I. I'm very fortunate to be able to contribute um, on Saturday before my mentor George Knapp, and then before Bob comes on, and I'm going to be talking about something uh, a number of projects I'm doing. But my point is this: uh, let's backtrack one second. The point is is that this is a very important topic to engage in conversation. I don't sit here hoping that disclosure with a big D is coming and that any government in the world is going to come forward and talk about it because it's quite possible they don't even know what's truly going on. But what I am hopeful about and why I think this is a worthy effort and why I think the citizen hearing was historic and will prove to be historic and why I think the footage is so important, and making it available to the public is so important, yeah. and why I commend Ruben on taking such extreme efforts to make the footage immaculate, is because every step matters, every point counts. As we educate ourselves, as other people join the discussion, we get closer to the truth. And this is really what I'm in it for. This is really what intrigues me. This is the biggest story never told. That's, time. that's what brought actually every single one of us here. I know, Ruben, you, you're doing this for the truth. I, I haven't seen you guys become millionaires or anything for that matter. You guys have put a lot of money and time in it. You know, it's been, in fact, the opposite. Right? You guys, no, no, actually, Ruben and I uh, have been unpaid. That's what I'm uh, saying. Well, you guys did the opposite. You didn't make money. You put in money and a bunch of yeah. time to make this happen. And so clearly, your goal is the same reason 
we're operating this show. Every one of us here, from Johnny all the way in the UK, Laura in the Midwest, and and you, uh, Ruben, all the way on the East Coast, uh, or south, Southeast, should I say, and of course, yep. just me being locally here with me, we are all in this for the truth. We all want the same goal, and I believe we're getting there. And let me tell you why I think we have a better chance now than ever. One Two words, alternative media. 30 years ago, you could not turn on the Internet and listen to Revolution Radio. 30 years ago, you could not be on the street, see a UFO land in front of a military base, and upload it to YouTube before your phone's confiscated by the Navy SEALs and you're put in a box for the rest of your life. This is what has changed the world. Now, as long as they don't interfere with our Internet, I think we are still uh, good to go. I I know we do have about six minutes before our next break, and, of course, we're going to be coming back to the citizen hearing. But I had a feeling I heard Johnny start to say something we were mentioning, Bob Lazar, before we get past that point. I wanted to see, Johnny, did you have something to say? I wanted to ask Jeremy uh, regarding his interview with Bob Lazar. Because when I first heard of Bob Lazar, as you said, it was back in 89. For me, it was 1991. But I, he had a web page, BobLazar.com, and I, I asked a few questions. And it was about um, the periodic chart. Obviously, today, we all understand what the periodic chart means. Um, but in, in 89, 90, was there such thing as an unpentium, you know, element 114, 115? You know, we look at CERN in Switzerland that is, you know, smashing atoms. Um, is there anything with today's information, you know, science today, they must understand that these periodic charts are valid and, you know, it must give credence and, and, and you know, respect to, to Bob Lazar for mentioning it beforehand. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is very interesting, actually. Um, it, it does give credence, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is 115 was theorized before Bob Lazar ever talked about it. That That's for certain. Um, but... Bob's description of 115 and how it worked in the antimatter reactor, you know, that's what's truly unique. Now, I do happen to know, um, and, I, and, and I know that George Knapp has talked about it publicly, that, that Bob was consulted all the way through when they were smashing atoms trying to make 115 in the Swiss lab. They, those scientists actually contacted Bob, is what, it, what I was told from George, G- and what George has announced on publicly before. So um, Bob, being the scientist that he is, um, you know, he had a very interesting thing to say about 115. And, you know, at, at this point, it's just a matter of looking at his story. Do you feel that the whole thing makes sense? Do you think Bob is telling the truth? It comes down to basically that. You I, when you, when you hear us. Hold on, gentlemen, both of you. I, I'm... I, before we get to the break, we actually do have a caller. I didn't want to interrupt you, Jeremy, but I figured now, since uh, I don't want this caller to carry over into the break, I might as well bring him in. Area code 352, welcome to the show. What's your name? Why, thank you. This is Doc Who. Doc Who, you have uh, any questions for uh, Jeremy or Ruben? No, I've been trying to get through to uh, Studio B, and they said call Studio A. I don't know if you can transfer me or not. Oh, no, we can't. Okay. Well, I didn't know. I am, no I, problem. You, well, you're more than welcome to hang on tight, and if you have any questions for any of them, uh, just uh, shout in. But anyway, go go ahead, Jeremy, what you were saying, and, and Johnny, I know you were making up that point. Uh, uh, let me throw in one thing about Bob Lazar. is one, When they said, well, he was a C student, uh, how could he have made it to college? Well, you know what, people? I was a C student, and I school. I went off to graduate magna cum laude and then go off to get a doctorate. So you know what? It's not. That's BS. You know, you know this, this, is a, this is a whole other uh, can of worms and a whole other show. And I think that you should just hear it directly from the horse's mouth. And I think at the uh, 2015 International UFO Congress in February, you'll have the chance to hear it directly from Bob. So there's no point in us talking about it. Let's let Bob tell you Bob's story himself, and we're lucky enough that he's going to be doing that in February. So, um, you know, it's a fascinating story, you guys, and yeah. I just have but to say got, that... We've also got, Jeremy, the word of, of uh, John Lear, who, you know, he was there on the, one of the first nights, come out on a Wednesday night, and you'll see this thing flying about, and, and he went there, and he's one of the you know, the sole people that can back up Bob Lazar. Oh, yeah, no, trust me, I've been, I've been making a, a film on John for four years. I'm with you 100%. I, I know this story inside and out. I could talk to you about it for hours and hours. I, I guess to summarize it, 
bottom line, after all the research I've personally done into this case, deep, deep into this case, in my opinion, it is factual. It is 100% true. But, you know, everybody's got to make their own opinion or there's followers. They have to decide for themselves or it won't change their worldview. Yes, yes, exactly. And that, that's what it needs to come down to because you cannot force someone to believe something. All you can do is show them the door. They have to walk through with it. And by you guys not only touching on projects of what you're doing, Jeremy, with the Immaculate Deception covering the John Lear's life and which essentially also touches with George Knapp and, of course, Bob Lazar and Ruben working on a, a web series which uh, it's titled, what is it, Interviews with Extra Dimensionals. Uh, you guys, uh, on top of those projects, the citizen hearing, as we come back to again, that is what I think is one of the main things to change people's minds. If we can just get them to the door of saying, listen to this, 40-plus witnesses testified in a mock congressional hearing. It's as close to real as it's going to get, and these are unimpeachable witnesses. And that's what we need you listeners out there who have not seen this and are on the fence to go out and find more on this when we come back. Everybody stay tuned for hour two. Ruben also being on the southeast in Atlanta and Jeremy right here in California with me. And for our, I actually was saying this off air. This is the time I wanted to give both my guests a chance to tell you out there who's listening what's coming up for them, where to find them, and their current projects on top of what we've been speaking about. I'm, we'll start with Ruben. Ruben, what are you up to aside from working on the Citizen Hearing? Because I know that's taken a lot of your time, and I just can just yeah, imagine how you're doing other stuff, but I know you have <laughs> other projects in the works. Yeah, the, uh, the Citizen Hearing definitely has been my main focus uh, ever since its incarnation back in 2013. So it's it's still, uh, that's the number one project. And uh, I, I do have other passions um, that are related to the ET uh, topic. And uh, one is a, a new project that I'm kind of, it's more of a personal project that I'm currently calling Interview with Ed, uh, Extra Dimensionals is what the uh, Ed stands for. And uh, you might ask, uh, how does one go about to interview uh, these extra-dimensional or extraterrestrial beings um, with a video camera? <laughs> and um, what I've done, and this gets quite far from the actual citizen's hearing, so just a disclaimer, the citizen's hearing and the information there is, you know, as factual as we could possibly, uh, uh, as factual and credible as we could possibly get it. And, uh, and this other project is more, uh, I'd say a bit more esoteric and more a personal journey, uh, that I've taken where I, I started listening to some channel material. I'm sure you, you might be familiar with, you know, Bashar or the Palladians or, Absolutely. you know, Octarians or what, you know, all these different, uh, cha- uh these people who channel. claim to have. Uh, Channel yeah. material, yeah. Channel yeah. Extra Mr. Langdon. Yes. Um, uh, the best program I ever heard for, for actually doing that did involve a Ouija board, actually. But it was a consistent group that met together, and uh, it was uh, Lauren Knight Yadzik's uh, Cassiopeia Project. They they used that to avoid the whole bias of the channeling thing, where you get a lot of subconscious content from the channeler you know, instead of uh, right. Eh, yeah. Right, right. Has to the project. I haven't heard of that one. I'll definitely look that up. But uh, yes, you're right. The one 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 of the things that I've discovered through this journey is, well, basically, just I guess a quick breakdown is. There's a lot of people, cha- channelers, who claim to channel extraterrestrial entities or collectives, they like to call them. And um, so I started kind of listening to a lot of this, and I started noticing that a lot of them are overlapping what they're saying. And yet these people don't really know each other. They haven't met each other. Uh, and I, I don't know if they've been following each other's materials or what the deal is, but I, I kind of wanted to investigate and do more. Uh, get more knowledge on this. On this, so so I started uh, calling up some of these channelers and asking them if I could come and interview them, and not just interview them as the person, but 
can they channel some entities for me to interview? And uh, that's the direction I've been going. And I, so far, I've, I've uh, decided to turn it into a web series. And I've got five interviews that I'm going to launch the series with, hopefully, uh, after the holidays, maybe uh, early February. Uh, and I've interviewed um, the Palladian, Palladian Collective, the Ninth Dimensional Palladian Collective, and the Twelfth Dimensional Palladian Collective. <laughs> I've also interviewed the uh, Octarians um, and and Bashar himself, Daryl Erica, who channels Bashar. Um, and I've even channeled myself. So that's where it gets really freaky and uh, deep in the peanut butter, as Jeremy and I like to say. Um and uh, as well as a being from, I mentioned the Zeta Reticuli, so I'm kind of I'm trying to cover the galaxy with all these beings and, and their uh, intergalactic perspectives on humanity. And the crazy weird thing is they're all pretty much saying the same things, different words, and I've been following some of the actual channelers. Like I go into their houses and I spend a couple of days with them and I'm trying to find out what books they read and where they mm. get their information. And... To my surprise, or maybe not to my surprise now, I've kind of totally converted, um, they are not following each other's material. So at least so it's something I can discover. In yeah. Independence, yeah. you come uh, stumbling upon these books and ideas. And that's actually a, a, a good thing to yeah. verify, uh, to be able to, to authenticate their stories. Why? Because this is exactly what happened with abductions. So many people were right. telling the same exactly. story that you had to start paying attention. So. Exactly. So yeah, that was my kind of I, I came from that abduction. Actually, one of one of the uh, the I don't know if you guys are familiar with Barbara Lamb. Yeah, yeah, she's a been lot here studies. several times with us. Oh, awesome. So I interviewed her, and actually I went under hypnosis with her, and I channeled the beam myself, which was so cool. <laughs> so, um, so you have to look you look out for the series to find out more. I don't want to go into too much detail, but essentially that's the gist of it. It's, uh, it goes into a very uh, different realm than the citizen series. The citizen series is like the, the building blocks. Hey, they're here. We have the evidence. And then this is going into the whole other realm of why are they here? What are we doing? What's the big agenda? What, what's all this stuff all about? Why? What's the human race all about? All, that. all those tell, tell other her, questions where, that where we're going to get into. Where to find where you're going to have this? And, of course, your website. And uh, well, other- and then, the only, you know, it's 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 pretty basic. It's just this is a one man show, so it's there's a Facebook page called Interview with Ed. Um, you can find that, and it's really just a page right now. It doesn't have anything on it. Um, and then I probably will have uh, the Vimeo on demand uh, site will be hosting the the actual thing. So if you, I'll be posting on my personal Facebook page, so just follow me at Ruben Langdon. Um, on my Facebook page, and I'll have updates and all that on there for sure. So, and you, of course, you, you, yeah, you have RubenLangdon dot com as well, right? And RubenLangdon dot com. I, I'll probably have information there. So, if you don't have Facebook, you can go to my personal website. So, now, you know, yeah, I, all I can say is going to be the the amount of footage, the footage that I have right now. It's very fascinating. If you're into this sort of thing, uh, for a lot of people, it's not quite the cup of tea and uh, if it's not your cup of tea, I would just say don't even bother. Just go check out the citizen first because <laughs> this goes pretty far out there. And we are truly excited to follow this because I know you said this is dipping into your peanut butter. We all have peanut butters, but it sounds like <laughs> our peanut butters are all aligned here because at least and maybe each one of us is having a different brand of it, but. At least we're all the <laughs> yeah. same food, and that's what makes it yeah. so fascinating. And that's why I love speaking to you guys, Jeremy. I know you got a bunch of projects on top of the citizen hearing. Let's hear what you got going on on top of your speaking engagement, which you might as well throw out again. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, a lot of you know these aspects we're talking about. They are outside of my scope of awareness, but what I think is so you know beautiful is that it you know truth is perceived in fragments and from different angles of vision. Right? You have to be able to see the whole truth from different perspectives in order to understand it. And so that's why I think it's you know diversity is kind of so important in a field of research and investigation such as ufology, um, which is an unfortunate name for what we're looking at. But essentially, it takes all types, and your interests is different than my interests, 
your approach is different than mine, and that's just always going to make it great when we can collaborate on things to get a little bit closer to understanding. Um, in 2015, in February, coming up soon, I will be speaking at the International UFO Congress. Um, you can go to their website, which is just ufocongress.com, and you can look up under speakers, and you can find me there, Jeremy Corbell. I've actually posted a really cool little video piece that describes a little bit what I'm going to be speaking about at the event. But essentially, I'm calling it the Invisible College. It's kind of an ode to Jacques Vallée, who I think is one of the most important thinkers in the field of ufology since, you know, the beginning days of, of modern-day ufology. Uh, because he's had access that most... He's, yeah, he's had access in places that uh, we just haven't. And so uh, the things that he talks about are important. So I kind of did an ode to him in the title. But essentially what I'm going to be talking about is my personal experiences working with people who are part of, let's say, the Invisible College, just essentially technicians and, uh, and um, individuals who are really skilled, even geologists, who are really skilled in their personal sets of information that have opened themselves up to me, um, allowed me, in, for example, to NASA Ames to, to spend an entire day filming uh, the uh, discovery process of uh, alleged anomalous uh, objects. And so this is kind of what I'm going to be speaking about is how I've received help from people in very professional uh, governmental and non-governmental uh, positions to help move this information forward, which I find interesting. Everybody says there's always roadblocks and information being blocked and there's a truth embargo. And, you know, to some degree, we got to let go of that. The seeker is the finder. And I have found only help along the way, when, you know, from, from journalism, from, from journalists to, to scientists, um, to even mathematicians. And people, people have been open and willing to help in these investigations. And so I think that with an open mind and an open heart, we can get a lot done. So I'll be talking about that at the uh, UFO Congress. I will also be launching, for the first time publicly, the official uh, trailer or teaser, I'll say, for the film Immaculate Deception, which, as you know, is a film about John Lear and his life. I've been filming with John for over four years, documenting his life stories and escapades, as we can call them, um, and his life philosophy. And so I'll be showing for the first time in my presentation the trailer or teaser for that film, which I'll then make public online at immaculateception.com for everybody to see after I show it at that lecture. Um, additionally, at the UFO Congress, I will be premiering uh, a film that I'm calling Patient 17, and it follows the subject of Dr. Roger Lear, who was the uh, specialist who devoted his life to removing alleged off-world implants, so alien implants in individuals. This is what he alleged. So I looked at this through the, through the eye of, of a film and uh, have been following... Uh, the, the patient, the last patient before Dr. Lear passed away, patient number 17. And that's what that film is about, and I'll be premiering it in its uh, current state in February at the film festival. So I'm very excited about that. Um, this film was an accident. It actually started with Ruben saying, hey, Jeremy, will you go film a little bit of Dr. Lear? I think it's really cool. We, we, you know, we want to do something about this. And I had no intention of this becoming the saga that it has. But what's happened is I've become friends with the patient, and I'm really seeking to get answers for him because, honestly, the answers have not been forthright. And uh, this guy put his body on the line. He literally laid down for surgery, you know, under the good faith that he was going to get some answers. And um, we've been hard-pressed to get him answers. But I've taken this sample, you know, many places to try to get a deeper understanding isotopically and from the elemental spectrum what it is that was embedded in his leg, and that's what this movie is about. It's about this individual and his journey. So that's what I'm doing. I've got a number of other big announcements I'll be making at the 2015 International UFO Congress. Um, it'll be like a hub or a place where you can go see all of this content and all the other projects I'm working on. So is look Jeremy, forward to that. 
Yeah. There is there is just one little point I would like to hand you. I saw an article, and I believe it was out of a science journal, but it was an online thing, uh, just this week, about how they can put microchips in you and and uh, wrap them in spider silk, and it makes them biologically in- inactive. Interesting. Yeah, I that's thought that was fascinating. I wouldn't be surprised yeah, if of- that's reverse engineered either. Yeah, I I posted it as, this is the way the aliens do it. (laughs) Yeah, that's interesting, you know, because one of the anomalous aspects to these alleged off-world implants that people are claiming that they have is that there is no rejection process, as you probably know, within the body to push this obviously metallic um, object out of their body. And, you know, I actually have seen the casing of these objects, I've been able to look at a number of them now very clearly, and um, it, it is interesting to me that these are not automatically rejected from the body, and that we can prove, in fact, that they've been in there for up to 10, 15 years. They have a little membrane the on them, though, right? Well, kind of you know, a- again, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm subject only to going to scientists and have them tell me, but yes, there appears to be some sort of protective coating around the objects that stop the rejection process. Again, I'm not a doctor. This is what I've been told. But my only reservation about that statement is that I know that people live their whole lives with lead bullets in the middle of their brains, you know? I mean, people have been shot and keep lead bullets in their bodies without rejection. So I I don't know where the line is drawn or what precisely people are claiming. All I know is if we have the objects, we can submit them to interrogation through the scientific method. And that's what I'm interested in doing. But that is a very interesting data point about yeah, the, the spider's web. And also, yeah. Jeremy, uh, you know, people might have lead bullets stuck in their head for 20 years, but I, I doubt that those things admit low-frequency energies that, you know, NASA picks up. Like, uh, well, you bring, the you in the bring up another, you bring up a, another very important claim that has been established by Dr. Roger Lear. And that is that, in fact, these objects emit a frequency. Now, I myself have been on location and, you know, and have seen this, uh, these objects allegedly, and I have to keep saying that because, you know, one experience doesn't prove the gamut, but, but essentially that these things do emit a frequency. Now, this was read with a Gauss meter. From what I understand, a Gauss meter picks up, you know, electromagnetic energy, kind of like from a battery. So if you bring a Gauss meter up to your Canon 5D, which is what I shoot on my, my camera, you know, it will emit a little bit of electromagnetic frequency and you'll get a ping, like a, or a sound like that. Now, I don't know that that is in the 5 megahertz range as claimed by Dr. Lear. I don't know that that has ever truly been determined. I'm looking into that. But if, in fact, that is true, if, in fact, these objects, while in the host body, do emit a powerful deep space electromagnetic frequency, now, wouldn't that be something? But we would have to prove that. And it has not been proved to my satisfaction at all. Well, one other thing I, I, it's important, because I was there at this last surgery, and, of course, uh, just with you, Dr. Roger Lear was a clear, a very good friend of mine. As a matter of fact, I did two documentaries on him alone, uh, Alien Human Project 1 and Part 2. Uh, they were done about a year apart, and in between that year, this surgery occurred, and sadly, he passed away before we can get further with him. But I remember the first set of implants that I got to see when we shot the first one, and this was prior to the 17th surgery of course and again he was mentioning that these things not only are magnetic before they're removed because it seems to they lose that quality but they cause other things to be magnetized but nonetheless i didn't want to take up too much time on on my personal point on this but it's going to be a fascinating film everybody attending the ufo congress is going to have a chance to screen it and then after that, it's going to be, I'm assuming, on your website. Uh, Jeremy, before we get to the next break, which will be our final one in the next three minutes, I wanted you to finish on what else you're doing and then coming back to what we uh, mentioned about the, the, the big thing that you guys have been working on and been talking about throughout the show. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's it, basically. I'm, just, I'm real excited to be able to participate in the, the UFO Congress in February. Uh, I'm honored, actually. It's a childhood dream to be able to, you know, 
be able to share information with uh, George Knapp and Bob Lazar. I mean, I really am honored. I'm very excited. And at the same time, I'm, I'm really excited about people being able to engage some of my film work, both with Immaculate Deception and Patient 17. Um, you know, this is just the beginning of a whole lot of film work that I've been filming over years now that I'm starting to put out. And um, I also know that what Ruben and I are doing um, is going to be really exciting to, to have the citizen hearing. You have to understand, this is wave one. Okay, This is phase one. We worked really hard to get to the point where we could put these out on video on demand to people. I can say that for both Ruben and myself. We are so excited that now people can engage the footage online through video on demand. Phase two, and this is, we were hoping to do this first, but that got kind of a sidetrack. We're, we're, we're getting the funds. We're almost there. We're going to be putting everything to DVD and getting all the original contributors, these beautiful collector's item DVD set. So once we've achieved that, then we get to move into getting the citizen hearing out to as many people as possible. There's a number of shows on television right now that you're very aware of that uh, are going to be presenting some of our material. So we are just so excited to, for the public to be able to engage with having sat through the footage and edited and remastered it, basically, and uh, going through hours and hours of footage. One of the uh, key things that stood out to me that was kind of overlooked during the hearing was the testimony of Danny Sheehan. Yes, yes. And, and, and he well, would be somebody... Because he's been on uh, my contact list, and exactly. Yes. So I'm glad you mentioned him. And that is uh, probably, I'm going to write him tomorrow or call him tomorrow. Yeah, I would definitely get him on the show because uh, because of his history and his, uh, you know, he he's the one that... Uh, did the um, what was it the the Pentagon Papers right that yep. helped uh, the the uh, Iran and the Iran Contra scandal you know put and the whole more. You, you know, he and the, so much more he's done so yeah. much he helped John and, Matt, uh, and he also got yeah. he was yeah. able to there was a lawsuit involved with the federal government where he was shown Roswell photographs but they he was not allowed to take them out of the um, archives or uh, are out of uh, he was not allowed to copy them but he was just able to show sh- shown them to show they exist uh, of course the attorney client confidentiality plus court gag order but like you said just to cut this short yes he does everything yeah, so, I'm, 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 so he he uh, was actually on the um, committee the panel as far as on the committee uh, just kind of serving, you know, originally we had him and Joe Buckman, uh, who was chair of the Libertarian uh, Party, at, at, who were very informed about this issue, just in case, and they were kind of just sitting there, just in case the um, the actual Congress members were kind of, this was just too over their head, and they didn't know what they, where to go, what questions to ask, they were kind of there as, as advisors. At the end of the day, they ended up not, uh, not, really jumping in. I think Joe asked one question and then Danny was, was just there, but Danny was also a witness on day one. Uh, he came in and I think on the day five as well. Um, and kind of gave his two cents and he had some very powerful things to say and his experiences too, his testimony on, on, uh, what he saw when he was working with the Vatican and, um, uh, and the Jesuits. So that very powerful testimony. Maybe you can get him on. He can uh, tell you a little bit about that. So that just came up because you're looking for guests, and I see yeah. something that I think you get on. And it stuck out to you, obviously. And it did stick out with me. Um, but just you know, overall, the you know the the Bent Waters panel, obviously going into depth, and I never knew that those guys had the problems they were having with the medical records and everything else, which just I think that was what really sealed the deal for the Congress members was this is a serious issue where people are being denied their, their medical rights. Uh, especially and, by, by fellow of, of Americans and, and especially by fellow V veterans. The, yeah, exactly. So that, that obviously was a huge, uh, uh, insight. Um, it was a little confusing at first. I think it was the, the order it was given, um, but it was a uh, two two panels. So it was actually almost about three hours of testimony or more, um, and 
yeah, it was really in depth and, and well done. Um, the anonymous testimony that you know Jeremy and I went and filmed, and uh, and then Jeremy put together this small snippet. Even though he wasn't there in person, we had the short video that was released online to the world the same day. Uh, very powerful testimony, um, and and the repercussions of you know of of, of the, the whole panel and everything, and. It, uh, and then I guess you said top five. I'm, I'm just learning off as yeah, many as I can. Yeah, three so the, far. South, the, the South American panel yes. um, was very powerful because you had the actual pilots there, you had the actual people involved in these cases, and you get you got a more insight on events that which are not normally talked about in the UF, UFO world and ufology in, in America. So uh, that was very insightful and, you know, and, and kind of put the global stamp that this is not just happening, you know, in the English speaking countries, this is happening all over the world and, and some very powerful things are, are going on here and we need to pay attention. So, yeah, that's kind of, I don't know if that's top five, but those are ones I would say, please watch out for. And they, Maybe were, can add, add. they were all astonishing. Every single one of them uh, that, that you just mentioned, those are ones that too stuck out in my head, especially like you said with Penniston and Burroughs. As a matter of fact, when Burroughs and his uh, lawyer Pat Frasconic joined us here, uh, we spent very little time on Rendlesham and the majority of this show on the VA hiding their medical records relating yeah. to the, the suffering they've gotten from the Rendlesham. Right. Well, and and that's because that that ev- that's undeniable evidence. You know what you saw and what he said and she said that. That can always be twisted and turned, but um, that evidence is just it's hard evidence, and it, I think it's an eye it's an eye opener for people who aren't well read into the subject matter, and they they can really get it. And that begs the question: Is what is so secret of someone's medical file that their medical file is classified to the point that they can't receive treatment? So obviously, that thought alone is very provocative, Jeremy. What about you? What what stood out to you? I mean, I know you guys were both extremely uh, busy working this event, filming it. I, I I remember as I was watching it live, I you know I would see you guys, you know, heading across, taking care of technical issues. So you obviously had to see and deal with everything. But I know you guys were being blown away because, of course, we spoke about it several times. So, Jeremy, just uh, the same thing I asked Ruben. What stuck out with you? If yeah, you well, actually, for, yeah, my, my experience, actually, I, I had the, the luxury job. Ruben was really holding down the sport. Um, I got to just kind of pick off witnesses and talk with them, and I wasn't as involved at that time as I have been since. But um, I, I kind of had the fun job of being able to, to grab people, pull them aside, and interview them. And, you know, I did this really interesting interview um, with uh, both of the, the the individuals involved in Rendlesham. And what I found so interesting about that, so there's three things in the testimony that really stood out. You know, one is watching the reactions of the congressman and the senator as uh, the guys from Rendlesham are talking about their experience. I mean, here you have two American heroes standing up there asking some very basic questions, like rights to their own medical file because of the uh, illnesses that they have and not being able to get them and, and all of this, you know, these things that are, that are tragic. But what you take away from it is that these individuals had a real experience, that this experience is documented to be um, something that is extraordinary and that they came forward to help clarify to the world and to people under oath what happened to them. So that hearing that testimony, sitting in that room and being able to kind of take them aside after and talk with them about it was fascinating. You know, it's, it's different when you hear a story from someone else, but when you hear it directly from the individual who experienced it and you can see in their face the emotion, you can see in their face, uh, you know, essentially the, that they're recalling real experiences, that is impactful. That is very impactful as, as an individual investigating these circumstances. The other aspects of the testimony that I found, you know, quite compelling. Um, one is uh, a story that I'm, you know, was very familiar with, but again, to, to hear it firsthand 
And um, that would have been the story by uh, John Callahan. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Callahan's story. Uh, and, and if you're not, you know, he was, I think, second in command of the FAA, and he had an unidentified aerial phenomena, as they like to say, or near-miss situation. Uh, there was ground radar, air radar, um, there was air visual by the pilot, the, you know, the Japanese uh, pilot himself. And uh, there was a huge, unidentified object caught on radar for about 30 minutes. And the most incredible part of his story was when the CIA came in and they swooped it all up. They brought everybody into the room and they told them to raise their hand and to swear that they have to understand this meeting or event never happened and you're all sworn to secrecy. And as John Callahan said, who were they to swear me to secrecy? I'm the, the, the second in command of the FAA and this is an issue uh, of proportions greater than any terrestrial law. So what did he do? He kept a copy of the footage. They asked him, they, you know, this is where you give me the footage. He gave it to him. They never asked if he had another copy. So this guy kept it and sat on it, and then he's come out and told his story, testified under oath, and just the way he did it. I mean, this is a tough Boston guy. People don't push him around, not even the CIA. And <laughs> to hear him tell this story... And to, to know and to see, I've actually been able to see some of the footage, to, to see the actual you know, radar footage. I mean, it is astounding. He is sitting on evidence. And, you know, I asked him, I went up to him after he spoke, and I said, you know, uh, so, wow, everybody must be jumping at, at the bit to, to talk with you and to see this footage and all this stuff. And he goes, you know, I've been ha I had this a long time. I've told my story a long time ago. And he's like, you know, I have it. I'm willing to show it. So, so that's what always been interesting to me is the John Callahan story is much bigger than people understand, and, and I would like to see it developed a little further. So that, that would be my second one. And my last one, I'll just give you three. Um, again, I concur with Ruben because we lived it. You know, the, uh, the anonymous interview, um, I was able to cut, what, you know, 13, 17 minutes or something, you know, that, that we could show people. But there was a lot more to that interview. And what we're trying to do is, is, is tell it, tell this story in a, in, in a fashion or in a way that is uh, responsible and respectful. Remember, this is a guy who couldn't come to the testimony because he's, he was too ill. But he wanted, and what he thought at the time was his last days of his life, you know, he wanted to come into a packed motel room in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of strangers and tell this story. He didn't even want his identity shown. It was up until the 11th hour when he said that we could show his face, even. So this is a guy that wanted to maintain his security, wanted to maintain his anonymity, and to the day still basically does. And, um, you know, he's not a healthy man, but he essentially he survived that, that window where he was worried about his life uh, because of normal health issues, being an elderly gentleman. But I just found that so compelling. And I hope that you do, too, when I can release more of the footage with Ruben. Um, this testimony is coming from a man who, as far as we can tell, uh, had the experiences that he claims to have. And I'm not a polygraph, personally. I'm a human. But <laughs> I can tell you his story is fascinating. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, I, as I mentioned when we were off air, and this was actually on my mind, I was, was going to segue into Anonymous, but going back to Callahan for one second, he truly fascinates me because that is, again, another man with such high credibility who is unimpeachable and yet – have being the second in command of the FAA, something major happening in the FAA, yet them coming to take the copy away of the, the radar, uh, the, the radar video and, and telling him it didn't exist. Uh, I mean, just phenomenal. Thank God he kept a copy for us to see. Uh, real quick before also, I go, can I, can I, hold, I just hold like one, second, one more point. I, I just got one, uh, one, one thing that we didn't met, get to mention during the, the break that the station owner just passed down to remind all the listeners 
listeners that there is uh, the annual auction going on. So I just got to throw this in because I know we will get cut off. Everybody go to free, our, our com slash auction. Anyway, uh, that was supposed to have been done earlier, but I didn't get this message. So now, uh, nonetheless, we have about eight minutes left, so we're going to have to keep our questions and answers short. Johnny, go ahead, and then I want to go back to Anonymous. Okay, well, going back to John Callahan, I wanted to just make a point. You said that, you know, he says, how can we be sworn to oath and, you know, who's above us to do this? My understanding is, is oath swearing when it comes to secrets is done what they call an administered oath. It means that you don't have to stand up and swear a pledge allegiance or anything like that. It's an injection in you um, of secrecy. So that, that would answer that question. The other thing was is that I'm a bit sort of out on John Callahan with regard to, in initially he says the CIA come in, told him to shut up, took all the stuff away. But in his statement, he says that when he left the FAA, he was given a box, and in that box was some of the material that hadn't been taken. Can you confirm that? Oh, I personally can't. You would need to talk with John about that. But um, I just know that you know the question was what testimony was compelling, and uh, John Callahan was very compelling to me. To hear him talk as a tough Boston guy and to just kind of defy these rules that, you know, were trying to be imposed upon him. I, I found him to be a hero. So the details of which you should talk with John, uh, but as far as his testimony, I, that for me that was a highlight. Yes, yes. Uh, um, he was always been one of the people that I uh, has always stood out to me because he has always stands firm on his stance on this, and he will probably be one of the people that I seek out to. I do have uh, a contact with him. I haven't opened up that line of communication. We, gentlemen, we do have about five minutes left of the show, uh, and I do want to use this time to basically talk about with you guys, but I do want to throw what I didn't get to mention earlier back to Anonymous. For all you listeners out there, uh, Jeremy went with Richard Dolan to film an interview with this anonymous gentleman who was a CIA agent summoned to the White House in 1958 and with Eisenhower and Vice President Nixon at the time and told that basically the CIA stopped giving him updates on Area 51 and that Anonymous, along with his commanding officer in the CIA, were to fly out to Area 51 on the president's orders and go to the doorsteps and basically say, give the I, Ike an update or he will invade with the 1st Army Tank Division in Colorado. And that blew my mind away because it corroborated what I always thought of the beware of the military industrial complex speech from 1961 when he left office. And I was like, how can he warn us of something he created? And this proved my point uh, in my own mind that anonymous was basically saying he got cut out of the loop to the point of him threatening to use a armed forces to take over another base. But, that's yeah, Ruben, uh, Ru Ruben produced that um, interview, and what was so interesting, Ruben, I think I can speak for both of us, was that, um, you know, kind of setting that up, you know, we didn't really know what to expect going in at all, actually. We were not informed, you know, prior to really how this was going to go down, but I think that there's a lot in that interview. The, the public has only been able to see 17 minutes uh, because of, that's what we released at the citizen hearing, but there is a lot more to that interview. I know Ruben and myself are both excited to be able to develop that footage, um, you know, hopefully upon you know, more sales in the citizen hearing and getting that out to people so that we can refund our documentary truth embargo. Um, all and, of it you know, and, and not, hinges upon getting it out. Yeah. And not just the interview itself, but the history of it. Uh, Linda Moltenau and her experiences, she's, she did a five-day interview with him, uh, and we're going in depth into that as well, right, Jeremy? Oh, absolutely. That's really what this is about now. Linda Molson Howe is the one that opened and broke the story. She's the one that he was threatened about not to be able to talk to. This is Linda's story, and I want to be able, as a director and you as a producer, Ruben, we want to be able to highlight that. We want to be able to tell the story as it actually happened. So look forward to that. But, you know, right now, that's going to be, become part of the movie, truthembargomovie.com. You can check that out. But at this point, we have to refund that movie in order to keep working on it. Right now, we're working on fumes. Although we're getting a lot done, um, it's all based on getting the citizen hearing yeah. out into the public's hands. Yeah, and Jeremy, are you okay for me just to kind of 
clear the air for the what's going on with the uh you know, I get a lot of emails every day. People are like, "Where are the you wish, Ruben, you What's got going on?" Two minutes. Okay, really quick. So, so basically, we started the crowdfunding campaign for DVD specifically because that was never intended when we produced this whole thing. We got a flood of emails after the event saying, "Hey, I want a DVD of that." And we're like, "Okay, well, we need to, we need to, we need to figure out the budget. We need to crowdfund. We need to do something to get the funds for it." So we, we we started that endeavor. It turned out to be a very long one. We never actually met our final goal uh, for the funding for the DVDs. So what, what we went ahead and, and did, we kind of pulled the trigger early. We had the footage finished, but the final production of the DVDs is where we're still uh, working on right now. So what we did is we went ahead and pulled the trigger. We released the video uh, on demand, the video on demand, which is available now. You can go to the website and get that. Uh, and then we're taking the proceeds from that to finish the funding for the actual DVDs. And then we're going to get those DVDs out to everyone who donated. So stay tuned. We're, we're very close. You can see the lovely footage. We actually gave uh, the people who, who donated and who've been so patient, we gave them uh, inside access to, to the footage. So we're, uh, we've gotten a lot of compliments from that. So thank you guys for, for those of you listening who, <laughs> who are watching. Um, but yeah, essentially that's what happened. We're almost there. We're just getting our banks to the limit where we can actually go and actually do the physical production of the DVDs and ship them out to you guys. After that, then everything opens up and hopefully, uh, you know, we have the video on demand. Maybe we'll be selling DVDs. We don't know for sure yet or not, but first things first is our main goal is to take care of the donors, the people who, who donated almost over a year ago and are, have been so patient with us for this time. So that's yeah, and that's been, I just wanted to get that oh, out there. Hold on. No, just, thank you. And that's, yeah. Go ahead, Jeremy. I just want to basically thank you both, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Corbell and Ruben Langdon, for an incredible show. I just want to let you know that we only have a matter of seconds left, and I wanted to give you both a quick chance to make a final uh, five, ten-second statement. Go ahead. Okay, no, that's great. I really appreciate you know all of everybody listening and, and supporting uh, the citizen hearing and, and everything else we're doing. And it's real easy to find us, and it's real easy to engage this topic. And I encourage you, out of passion, that you should engage these topics and you should look up this information. And citizenhearing.org, go to it, support it, help us get this information out to people. Thank you very much for listening. Basically what he said. Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay, everybody. Thanks again for listening to Rome Radio, and we will catch you next week. And Tuesday night, you can hear me on Dark Matter Radio as well, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Pacific, 9 to 10.